Hello, welcome to extending service mesh to the edge. Let's get started. The agenda is actually very simple for this talk. Uh, we just want to talk about the motivation behind trying to extend service mesh to run on the edge. Uh, some of the key challenges that you would face, uh, a demo that would provide a solutions or our solutions for one of the challenges that we think exist. And then uh, we'll wrap it up by talking about some future plans that we have on the project. Typically, when we anyone talk about edge, uh, the first thing they ask is, uh, what do you mean by edge? And to address that, it makes sense to take a little time to talk about where we came from. We came from a project called OPNV Clover. And OPNV is an umbrella project. It stands for Open Platform for Network Function Virtualizations. Uh, and every uh, network function organization is basically the telco's way of attempts to uh, cloudify the network services. Um, and OPNV itself is an integration and testing projects where you take open source projects, integrate and them together, write some test cases, and try to make sure that they can actually address particular telco and every use cases. Particularly for Clover, we are interested to integrate cloud native related technologies or open source projects. Uh, and then trying to see what kind of NFE use cases we can address. Uh, and then in this case, uh, what we get feedbacks from users and then for, uh, after our investigation is there's a very strong inclination from the users that they want to use Kubernetes on all the current native technologies on mobile edge, uh, namely what we call MEC, which used to stand for mobile edge computing. Now it's multi-access edge computing. Uh, if you think about telcos, they actually have tremendous uh, edge site presence. Um, their radio networks, you know, you, when you, your cell phone connected to, um, to AT&T or someone, um, there's a close proximity base stations that actually terminates your radio connectivity. Uh, so they have those sites that are in small buildings. So, and then with compute powers. Uh, so they have actually, if you will, a micro data centers and that presence has been around for a very long time. Um, and then particularly for 5G upgrades because the bandwidth is so much bigger and then what kind of applications and implication of the applications that would come in. Uh, they are the MEC effort is there for taking advantage of that access compute power and then allowing third party uh, application owners or uh, players to be able to utilize those compute powers by running their applications. Um, so we are not talking about sensors or devices when we talk about edge. And therefore you don't see us doing something like virtual kubelet. We're talking about some level of compute power somewhere typically from single, single digit number of servers to maybe a few racks um, of x86 X, X, X or ARM based uh, servers sitting on the edge. Um, do note that we are uh, this particular technology that we're talking about today. Uh, it doesn't necessarily just address the MEC use case but it does address a use case where if you have servers on the edge and you want to run applications on the servers, uh, the benefits of actually running the service match all the way to the edge. Um, and then going back to that use case, uh, what makes sense for us in terms of deployments for Kubernetes is that we want to run cluster and auto control plane for that cluster independently on the edge sites. Um, obviously the benefits is the, the benefits are actually pretty obvious, right? Um, your, if you want to restart a pod, you want to reschedule the pods, all that decisions are made locally. So you don't have to go back to the cloud just to, just to restart and reschedule a pod. Um, and, and that's not anything majorly controversial right now. I think for the last two or three years, there's been a number of projects that are trying to address the, uh, the use case of um, um, lightweight Kubernetes uh, engines. So what we see here is um, something like a K3S from Rancher or micro K8S from uh, Ubuntu are all example projects where they're actually trying to address a lightweight Kubernetes cluster use case. Um, and another one is if you have this kind of deployment, um, what kind of application are we looking at? So uh, going back to something like a, a MEC or any kind of edge data center, micro data centers, you are trying to run a single applications that have components that spans across both edge and, and cloud. So, so that's, that's what we get actually and feedback from some of the users from the OpenNV community also. Um, AR VR, when, when the control 
things would be the control analytics and all that all that may be running on the cloud but then the, the processing of frames and, and, and videos will be running on edge where uh, or machine learning where the inference engine would actually be running on edge and then all the learning capabilities are running on cloud or IoT gateway where some sort of filter is running on edge and then the core analytics engines would be running on cloud uh, so these kind of applications where they are basically single applications that spans across both have microservices that are running components that are running on cloud and components that are running on edge. So we'll make an argument, and that's actually the gist of this um, this presentation, is that it makes a lot of sense to run a single mesh across the cloud and edge sites for this kind of applications. Uh, the obvious one is that you know once you do that, you have a consistent network policy and telemetry formatting models across a single applications across different sites, uh, your, your cloud or edge. Um, so you can write basically the same framework. You, you, can, you can treat it as basically just an extension on your applications, just like how you would write it for any of the single mesh applications that you have that runs in a single data center. Um, and also um, Istio, the major use case for Istio really is uh, CI-CD pipelines, uh, canary releases, uh, 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 red black testing, AB testing type stuff. Uh, for those things, um, for Istio's particular single mesh, it's actually running very well. Uh, Spinnaker, for example, is already integrated with Istio for over a year now. So, and then we do think that for this kind of features, the ability to do kind of re releases, the CI CD pipelines is critical for edge deployments because physical access is very expensive for edge sites. So you, you want to automate the process of deployments uh, uh, or only reciting parts or things like that, uh, or basically fully automated to avoid having actually you know, technicians accessing uh, edge sites all the time. So with all these benefits, uh, that is you know, sort of obvious really. Um, why have no one done it before? Or why haven't actually, so actually we thought about doing that uh, as early as uh, I would say mid, Second half 2018, when Clover was in uh, was in major development uh, time. Uh, at that time, actually, we had a we encountered we investigated and we encountered a major blocker, and that was actually that's the a component called Mixer. Uh, Mixer is a Istio control plane component, which is actually an engineering model. It's a, it's a very good idea, as a as a theory. Um, what it does is um, because as you probably know, Envoy, which is the proxy engine, a data plane, if you will. On, uh, on Istio runs on every single part. Um, so it's a side, it's what we call sidecar. So on every part that gets spawned, there'll be a Envoy side, a workload part that gets spawned, there'll be an Istio proxy, which is Envoy running. Um, Mixer, the idea would be, oh, you have potential thousands of these running. Uh, if we have complicated policies or complicated uh, policy, uh, complicated telemetry policies, or if you have a bunch of infra backends that does its own thing that needs to record, the sessions, uh, you 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 should centralize that capabilities into a, instead of spreading over thousands where it doesn't really scale. Uh, great idea, uh, but then because Mixer, as the name indicated, because you want to implement part of your network policies on the data traffic uh, in Mixer. Mixer is basically not a control plane component. It's actually a mix. I guess that's what the name means. A mix between data plane and a control plane. Uh, that. And, and how Envoy works is every single first request that comes in for a session, they would first get funded into Mixer and then they'll process it. And then, and then, and then we'll see whether or not it's yay or nay to actually go before Envoy can proceed. Uh, just by hearing that, you would, you, would be, you would know that it's actually pretty terrible uh, to run that on the edge. You can, rig, you can actually run Mixer on the edge. Like I in a multi-cluster um, deployment, you, they do, uh, Istio does actually assume that you run Mixer also on the uh, on the, the the other clusters, but then particularly for edge, it doesn't make sense because your infra backends probably doesn't exist on the edge. They're, they're mostly pretty heavy stuff, I would say. Um, so, if that's the case, then your mixer may be actually running on cloud. And if all your requests has to go to the cloud just to get mixer to say yes, uh, that's that's the kind of delay is actually completely unacceptable. But thankfully for us. Um, during uh, I think when either Istio one dot four one dot five, uh, the the Istio community decided to deprecate uh, Mixer, so it um, and then instead actually taking advantage of the rich set of filter capabilities on Envoy, 
that allows you to then uh, implement those complicated policies and technologies or, 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 or your custom protocols directly on Envoy uh, instead of actually having decentralized com uh, components to do so. And that in a way actually unblocks us from, uh, from moving uh, forward. So now that we start to resume looking at uh, running it still, extending it still to the edge again, um, one of the great things that you can do and a good opportunity to innovate really uh, when you run Istio to the edge is um, extending the Istio capabilities, the route routes, the policies into influencing your choices of which WAN connectivity links that you're gonna use. So in here, when I, when I say WAN, wide area networks, I don't just mean wide area networks with the typical definitions. Uh, and it, you know, because going between edge to cloud, usually you, you can go through for networking terms, you can go through access network, you go through like Metro, and then you, and then you go through like the real WAN, which is either long haul or the transcontinental links. Um, and here, when I use WAN, and it means like the combination of all of those. Um, and then when you are running WAN links, you can, um, it's very typical now that you have multiple WAN links uh, going from edge sites to cloud, or actually in the era of uh, SD-WAN, software-defined WAN, uh, the software-defined WAN capabilities would then be creating a lot of channels even if you only have one or two physical uh, WAN links uh, for different reasons like low latency or high bandwidth or you know or best effort and stuff like that. So so those are being defined. And then and then what we really want to see and then what we see the opportunity on is to map the Istio uh, policies and route routes into different WAN links. Depends on what their characteristic is. And actually, in fact, this is uh, this is going to be a very simple demo that we're going to run on you know, this technology that we use. Uh, before we actually go into the demo descriptions, uh, the demo and this solution actually that we, we propose um, actually utilizes heavily on this technology that we developed as uh, called Clovisor. Clovisor used to be part of, uh, it was developed as part of uh, OPNIV Clover, but it has since spun out and it's an independent project now. Uh, what it does is uh, it talks to Kubernetes or SDL uh, controllers. Uh, and then it, the big thing is it actually connects with the Linux kernel through uh, BPF technology. IOVisor is a open source technology uh, uh, under Linux uh, that actually uh, would compile and load what we call BPF code into a kernel. Uh, BPF, I hope you know what BPF is, uh, but if you don't, I probably don't have time to explain what BPF is. But then in uh, one liner would be, uh, is a kernel technology that allows you to insert your code safely into different event points in a kernel. So for us, for example, with the, the ingress of a network device and the egress of a network device, we can insert our own code in there and it's, it's kernel safe. Uh, the compiler ensures that it won't crash the kernel. And then this, so this is Clovisor. It runs in a daemon set, so it runs on every single node. Uh, and this, so let's talk about a demo. The, the description of the demo. The demo, the setup is um, pretty simple it's setup actually. I run two VMs on my MacBook uh, through VirtualBox. So I'm creating two internal links between those two VMs. Each VM basically represents a cluster. So I run a full Kubernetes clusters on each um, VM and tamed it. So the master runs here and all the minions runs here too. Uh, all, all, all the parts we schedule on just this one uh, node. Um, and then uh, I also utilize the Istio multi-cluster capabilities uh, deployment. Uh, so there's three different deployment scenarios. The, uh, the one we pick is replicated control plane separate networks. Um, this is because, well, uh, uh, the, the, the other two are share control plane separate networks and share control plane same network. Um, the last one actually doesn't really make a lot of sense for, for practical purposes. Uh, it's probably more for testing so we didn't use it. I think the second one, which is the shared control plane and uh, separate networks, that actually reflects much better on the cloud and uh, edge relationships. But then we still do the replicated control plane because it's the easiest to set up. So that's basically the only reason. Um, what this does is, um, and, and for the setup, it, as, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are two interfaces that are running between the two clusters. So they're similar to WAN link. So this is WAN link A and WAN link B basically between the two. And um, let's 
uh, so the idea is um, this is one Istio cluster, Istio uh, instance running on a uh, Istio uh, instance running on a single cluster, and then there's another one. Uh, and then when Sleep wants to access any of this actually event, it would go through Istio Ingress Gateway. And then the point is um, through our solutions, uh, based on the route rules that you use to go to either v1 or v2, it would then select either one of the WAN links to, to map into that route rules. So let's get right to the demo. Hi, so this is the demo uh, screen. What you see here is there are three windows locked into the edge node, and this is the cloud side. Uh, this is Going back to that slide deck, this is basically having actually bin that would actually maps minions to version two of actually bin and everything else to be one. Uh, as you can see, there are two interfaces, two uh, WAN interfaces that we simul the simulated WAN interfaces. One of them is 1.3 and 2.3. And then um, if you look into the Istio gateway, Ingress gateway IP address, which is when we are setting it up, uh, we set up such that the, um, the sleep pod here the sleep pod here uh, has a DNS rule that would uh, forward the IP address of this guy when they're going to actually be bin. Um, and then also the Envoy would intercept the packets and forward it over uh, with a new port number. Um, if you look at it now, uh, we set up a route that goes to the ingress gateway. So Envoy would select that the interface to, to, to forward it out. Uh, and if you look into packet throw between the two. The good thing about using this is uh, there's hardly any packets, or actually there is, really isn't any packets going through the two internal interfaces until you actually start forwarding stuff. So as you can see from that route rules here, um, we are looking at user minions and actually the second user that I name is boss. So here there's a boss, uh, the boss uh, uh, user, curl-u boss. So if it goes there, it goes through uh, interface, the first one interface. And then if you use user minions, it still goes through this interface. So nothing gone through this. So let's get started. What we do here now is um, creating, creating a, Clovisors to ask them to use the WAN uh, policies, the mapping. So if you look at this, it's basically asking them that anything that matches port 3000 and minions uh, would then be rewrite into this and then, for, and then redirected over to this particular link. So again, if you do boss, if you do boss, it doesn't change anything. It's still going through this. Um, if you um, if you do minions instead, you can see that it's now going through S nine. So once again, if you do boss, it's going through this. If you do minions, It's going through this guy. Oh, we have to take some time. Yep, it's going through this guy. So that's a very simple demo to see with the route rules. So what actually really is happening under the hood then? So what, what's happening under the hood? So basically, the first thing you do is um, Clovisor, you're loading a WAN mapping into a Clovisor. This WAN mapping uh, would then tell them, as we saw earlier, uh, what route rules 
are mapped to which WAN interface. Uh, we learn the route rules from Mistio D. So in this case, um, we do have to reapply that route rules over to the to 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 the edge also because it's still D, even though it's replicated control plane, actually doesn't really sync the route rules across different clusters. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we we learn that we learn how we we implement this, uh, and then in sleep on the edge side, the the, the part sleep it has an envoy, which we load a Luau the Lua filter. So what does the Lua filter do? What it does is uh, it's for everything that matches an HTTP rules uh, or any HTTP things that matches port 8000 in this case, because we use Sakai inbound, it hasn't actually changed to port numbers yet. Uh, it extracts the HTTP header information and send it over to, to Clovisor. So Clovisor would, for, for example, we basically match with the rules that say it's uh, actually user equals dominions, then do something. Um, then Clovisor takes that from Mistio, understanding what it is, and then knowing that this maps to a particular new WAN link, takes the session info and program BPF um, to then start routing things for this particular sessions to S9. Once that redirect rules is in place, um, anything that sleep sends that matches minions would then be routed into S9. Anything that, that sends to anything other than minions like boss in, 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 our, in our demos, it would still go through S8, go through a different WAN link. So this is actually the cluster of what's going on inside. So basically what happens is uh, on, on, on the full measures, once we have a rules settings for Clovisors, another one is to be able to read from STLD. Um, we have a Luau filter on a uh, Lua filter on, uh, on an Envoy. So they will actually forward us HTTP information on new sessions. Uh, Clovisor implements that route rule classifications, uh, maps it into the session information and program BPF. And then subsequently all the packets would then be forwarded into a different WAN link. For future enhancement, so this is cool. Hopefully you, you think this is good. Um, for future enhancements, uh, what we, some of the things we're looking at is um, Let's say you actually have um, a very resource constrained edge node where, because Envoy is being deployed per, as a container per pod, per workload pod, it, it can, you, may, you may not have applications that actually require that, particularly an edge maybe actually isn't needed. Um, particularly uh, talking to users, there really is a difference between whether or not your application is CPU bound versus IO bound. Um, your, a lot of times your applications in edge may not be very chatty, it may not be as chatty. It would, it would actually be um, probably wasting resources to actually create that extra containers. So one thing you may want to do is to create Envoy that runs on, uh, that basically runs on, sorry, that basically runs on as a, as a single entity where multiple pods would be able to go through the same Envoy. So the Clovisor portion is kind of, more simplistic. So when you when you deploy Envoy, the first thing you do is an init container is that basically set it into uh, the, the, the set uh, uh, the IP table rules so that you you route all the path traffics or incoming or outgoing traffics onto Envoy. So Clovisor can actually do this by using something called SockMap, which uh, acknowledgement to uh, to Project Cilium folks, they actually created this SockMap capabilities. If you know TC splicing, it's basically the same thing, except it's programmable TC splicing that allows you to switch packets from one socket to another socket. So we can, we can utilize SOGMAP capabilities and basically create Envoy as a non sci entity, but then at least one per namespace per node. Why one per namespace per node? Because of security reasons. Um, uh, Any things that before going into Envoy are clear text. So you would, you would at least trust everything in your namespace to actually do the right thing. And that being the case, then you would send it out onto a, a per name, say per node, because if you go out on to the node, you do not it is you know you do not want unencrypted things go out to go out on the physical interface. So, so this is actually something that we are exploring. Uh, some of the hard thing is to to make it still works with a non sidecar envoy. Another thing that very quickly because it's almost time uh, is um, how to actually ship logs. So right now, this is not really part of the Istio control plane. It's not Istio D. 
the, the, the log collectors, the uh, trace collectors, and the metrics collectors are all separate entities that you have to deploy yourself. Um, it really doesn't make sense to deploy that in Edge. So we would like to figure out solutions that you can, but you still want the telemetry information, the log inf information, the metrics information, the trace information particularly are very useful. So one of the things to think about is, you know, can we store them in batch and send it out? Or instead of, you know, do we, do we want them to keep on sending it when, utilize, utilize when by keep on, traces are pretty taxing because if they, I think these whole configuration is open traces, send out two traces, two spans uh, uh, all the time. So out of the pod. So this is pretty frequent operations if you have a complicated applications. So this is one thing to really think about moving forward on how to address this on an edge cloud deployment. So in summary, uh, there, as we said, there are a lot of benefits of running service mesh across cloud and edge. Uh, we demonstrated the WAN associations. It's actually, uh, we, we believe it's a very good features, particularly with SD-WAN. Um, this will definitely be very powerful moving forward. Uh, and then for the future, we would, if you have any resource constraint or concerns on sidecars um, and or the control traffic in general, there are two major areas to, to investigate and address. Uh, we do wanna conclude by saying that we believe that edge computing is as much, if not more of a networking problem as it is a computing problem. So that being the case, um, I think, you know, application needs to be aware that they're running on edge instead of on, on cloud. Uh, and then and then the infrastructure needs to be invested heavily on how to solve the problem on a networking perspective. Um, so if you want to contact me, if you're interested in the project, uh, please contact me. This is Clovisor project at Gmail. And the code is actually in GitHub, Clovisor, Clovisor. Um, Thank you for attending because I know this is, uh, by the time you guys look at this session, it will be uh, one of the last ones for the events. So it's, uh, it, I, I, th I thank you very much for staying and attending. Uh, and you guys have a nice weekend.